So beginning in John chapter 5, verse 1, and reading to verse 4. John writes, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, we'll start there. As we begin this, in verse 1, it simply says, notice, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So this is one of those feasts that is unnamed. We know that Jesus is what is referred to as an observant Jew. So Jesus would observe the different uh, festivals and feasts of Israel. And so as an observant Jew, Jesus determined to go, and he went alone. Now under the Mosaic Covenant, Jewish males were required to attend mandatory feasts. According to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. And so observant Jews, males were commanded to appear to observe that particular feast. This one is not named. It simply says there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus, as an observant Jew, notice, went up to Jerusalem. You'll never read it, the scripture say, went down to Jerusalem. It's always ascending. And so he went up to Jerusalem. And he goes on in verse 2 to say there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, so he gives to us a location, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. And so what we have here is a chapter that is recording Jesus' healing of a crippled man, and the location is the city of Jerusalem. Uh, this healing that we're about to look at is the third miracle recorded in the Gospel of John. John has already recorded that he had made water into wine and recently had, he had healed a nobleman's son. Now, in the uh, Gospel of John, there are seven miracles recorded. He didn't record every single miracle of Christ, but he chose to record seven of them with particular reasons. Later, he would write that there are also many other things that Jesus did which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. He said that in John 21, 25. So he didn't record all the miracles, but this particular miracle is included in those selected for the gospel. And so I'll begin by asking the question, why? Why would this miracle be included in those selected for the gospel of John? Seeing that he only records seven, and seeing that he closes his book by saying there are many others that could have been written, and recorded, why did he record this one here? Well, the answer seems to be that the healing of the crippled man is associated with the work of Messiah. The healing of the lame or the crippled is associated with works Messiah would perform. You see, in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 35, verses 5 and 6, it says, The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And so the Jews knew that that particular verse, those verses in Isaiah, were speaking of the day of Messiah. And so it would seem that John recorded this particular miracle, the healing of a crippled man, because that would give credentials to Jesus. So you'd see he is Messiah. And so the location, again, verse 2, is uh, it says in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, there's a pool. Now, this is the gate that sheep were brought in to be offered in sacrifice in the temple, which obviously is why it was referred to as the sheep gate. And uh, this is in a place, notice, 
it says uh, in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, there's a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda. Uh, the word Bethesda means house of mercy. And it actually is called Bethesda because of the work that Jesus performed there. We go to this uh, location every time we go to Israel. And uh, it's there in the city of Jerusalem. It's a little bit, it's a little to the west of the uh, Temple Mount. And uh, we go there every time. We've been there numerous times. And, and we'll have a Bible study there because um, the ruins uh, are, still, are still there. And in the same location is a place called St. Anne's Church. And at St. Anne's, um, we'll go in. And it's a, a beautiful church that is um, just, it was made in such a way that when you sing, you actually sound like you can. It's just amazing. <laughs> and uh, so we'll go in there and we'll, uh, we'll worship. And you'll be in there sometimes and a group from a different land will come. Perhaps Germans will come in or French will come in. Italians will come in and, and they'll sing worship songs to Jesus in their language. And so you'll be in there and you'll be listening. And sometimes you may recognize the song they're singing. So you may sing along with them and just worship in this place. And so this location is, is very well known. We go there every time we go to Israel. It's a beautiful place. And we always share from this passage here. So he says... In verse 3, in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, some commentators, as he's speaking about this, as they're speaking about this, see their physical condition as a picture of, of their actual spiritual condition. I want you to see this. Notice again in verse 3 how it says sick people and then describes them blind, lame, paralyzed. So he's speaking of those who are sick, blind, lame, and paralyzed. Let me show you something. The commentators will see that this is a picture of their spiritual condition. So when John speaks of them as being sick, they were sick people. The word sick means diseased. It also means to be weak or without strength. And so, when it says that they're sick, of course there's a physical illness, but it also could represent the fact that they are weak, being weakened by sin and in need of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 6 says, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And so when you see this, that he's sick, they're sick. Yes, there are physically ill people, but in a spiritual sense, there are those commentators that say, you've got to see this as deeper than simply reporting that there are ill people there. There were people who were showing up there who are representative of man without Christ, man without God. And so they're sick, they're weak, they're unable to save themselves. And then he speaks and says, they're blind. Well, those who are blind are incapable of discerning truth from error. It could be spiritually blind, not simply physically blind. And again, that's the condition of all humanity. Because those who don't have the Lord and haven't been enlightened by the Holy Spirit are spiritually blind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, Paul said, Even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Without the Holy Spirit's illumination, People are going to remain blind. That helps me. I hope it helps you too, especially if you share your faith with people. Uh, there, there, there were times in my early walk with the Lord when I, I felt if I simply wield the spirit, uh, the sword of the spirit properly, that I can help people to see. Well, the fact is, those who are spiritually blind resist the things of the spirit of God. It, it, it isn't your argument. That is going to bring someone into the kingdom of God. It's not your logic. It's not your capacity to put things together in a fashion that makes sense. Because I've had those conversations where I've known beyond a shadow of a doubt that this makes sense. And they ought to see this. But they end up not listening and not seeing it at all. And that's when I finally came to realize the scripture and what he's saying. He says, no, 
Their minds are blind. It takes the power and conviction of the Holy Spirit working in accordance with God's word to cause people to see that they are blind. They have to. You know, there is none so blind as the one who will not see. And so when you share and and all, that's why I've learned that it's my, my, my ministry to present truth, but it's God's work to convict sinners. And when his word is presented and we have prayed and we leave it in the hands of the Lord, well, one man may sow and, and another man may water, but God gives the increase. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so one, these are people who are sick. These are people who are blind. And then these are people who are lame. Now, we used to say that of our friends. Man, you're lame. The word lame simply means that he's unable to go where he would like to go. The word can be used of a person who is hesitant to move or unable to walk by themselves. Well, in Ephesians 4.17, Paul said, This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. So this is a person who is unable to walk by themselves, a person who is hesitant to move, a person who can't go in the right direction. So without Jesus, they'll never be able to walk. They'll never be able to live in a way that he's pleased with. As we've been going through Colossians in chapter 1, verse 10, remember how Paul said that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. He speaks of him, them being paralyzed. And they would say, the commentators would say, that's a picture of someone without faith, without hope, without love, without the fear of God. They're lifeless and they're hopeless. They're paralyzed. But God will give them an ability to have life when they turn to him and their sins are forgiven. Like the one who is at the gate called beautiful and and Peter and John were about to walk in. And as they were about to walk into this particular gate there in Jerusalem, there was a man who was laying there who had been infirm for, for many, many years. And, and as Peter and John were about to walk past them, the man looked up because Peter said to the man, look upon us. And the man looks up expecting to receive something because he was there in a strategic location at this particular gate because that would be a place where the pilgrims would enter in, the people would enter in. And it was a good place simply to beg, to ask for things, for alms. And so he was expecting to receive something. And the scripture is so beautiful when it says that Peter said, look upon us. And the man looked up expecting to receive something. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I say unto you, rise to your feet and walk. You see, you cannot rise to your feet and walk without Jesus. You know, and even when you are, quote, unquote, walking, you're always walking in the wrong direction. You're actually, in reality, spiritually paralyzed. You may think that you're pursuing God, but in fact, you're actually drawing further and further away from him as he's pursuing you. And so we have people here in verse 3 described as being sick, blind, lame, and paralyzed. And that is an actual, literal condition. They are sick. They are blind. They are lame. They are paralyzed, but it also could be a picture of their spiritual condition and their need of the Lord. They're waiting, according to verse 3, for the moving of the water. And then verse 4 is what is called an explanatory note. For an angel went down at a certain time into the, into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. So John isn't authorizing, by the way, the stirring of the water by an angel is genuine. What this is is an explanation. He's explaining what drew these people to be there by that water. He's explaining what they believed. And he's also saying this is what they did in response to their belief. And it seems that the people thought that the one moving fastest would be the one who receives the healing. Now think about that for a moment because even today people believe a variety of things will result in their being healed. Some believe that if they drink or bathe in water from certain locations like Lourdes, they'll be healed. Some wear scapulars. 
Some send money to radio or television evangelists for prayer cloths. When you go to Israel, there are, there are people that will buy olive oil or water, and it will take it home believing that, that it has healing power. I'll never forget my wife Marie and I were by the Jordan, and we were standing there many years ago now, and uh, these Italians were there uh, right next to us, and they were real excited and everything. And they, they were drinking beer by the Jordan. <laughs> I'll never forget this. They were drinking their beer. And they poured it out. Then they filled it up with the, wa the water to take home because they considered it holy. And I thought, how interesting that really is. You know, down your beer quickly so you can get some holy water to take home. <laughs> it never made sense to me. It still doesn't even tell you that. But that's what they did. <laughs> but... What we have here is uh, an insight into how the Lord works in spite of our misunderstanding him. This shows us how God's mercy is manifested. It reveals to us something of what God is like. The psalmist in Psalm 6 verse 2 said it well. He said, have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak, O Lord. Heal me, for my bones are troubled. And so these people would be laying in that condition, hoping the water would stir there are those who say, commentators who say that the water stirring was not an angel. It was, it was a naturally fed spring that on occasion the water would be stirred up by water coming in, an Artesian spring, and it would begin to move. And they had superstitiously begun to say that that is an angel stirring it. And it stirred the uh, faith in people to say, well, then I ought to get in because the rumor went out that if you got in first, you would be healed. Now, to develop something for you here, I'll go a little bit further. We need to remember that throughout the Bible, God does perform healings. And they occur in a variety of ways. And I believe that, that the reason that when you read your Bible and you see, in the New Testament especially, when you see God performing a healing through Jesus, um, they occur in different ways for a reason. Uh, that's so you don't put God in a box by developing methods of receiving healing. Because you may pray for somebody, we'll say, and they get well. And you just, you'll blow your mind like, God did something. I'm amazed. Wow. And that's what it's supposed to do, by the way. It's supposed to make you go, wow. That's what miracles do. They amaze you because something happened. But you can fall into the trap of saying, well, the next time somebody comes and says, will you pray for me? Then you say, no, sure, of course. Now, how was I standing last time? I had my left foot in front. I had my right foot back. I lifted my left hand, but I touched him. With, and you can actually do this. You really can. You can start thinking, what were the words I spoke? Uh, did I furrow my eyebrows because I was so intent? You can really do that. that. That sounds silly, but it's true. You can actually think, there must be some technique of some sort, something I did. And so in Scripture, you discover that the Lord does miracles simply because he does miracles. It hasn't anything to do with us. And you'll see that in Jesus' ministry. When you look in your Bible, sometimes uh, this miracle healing will occur in response to someone's personal faith in Jesus. Remember in, in the Gospel of Matthew, for example, chapter 9, verses 20 through 22, uh, those verses speak of a woman who had an issue of blood, and she had this issue of blood for 12 years. And, and so she said within herself, if I but touch his garment, I will be healed. So there was a personal sense in her that if I but reach to him, and that's a personal faith, and as a result, Jesus actually commended her faith. But then again, sometimes these healings, when you go through your scriptures, well, they occur in response to somebody else's faith. We just saw in the case of the nobleman's son that the nobleman came on behalf of his son. So the son was not the one who was requesting to be touched by the Lord. It was somebody else. And there's times when you may be saying, God, in behalf of my wife, my sister, my brother, my mom, my dad, my aunt, my grandmother, my friend, you're interceding. And there are times that the Lord will hear your prayer. And these people aren't asking of their own selves. You're interceding, and God does this work, and you see that. And sometimes, no expression of faith is evident at all. Remember in Mark chapter 2, remember that man who was brought by his four friends? 
and was brought before the Lord and his friends exhibited faith. But that man didn't. What could he do? He couldn't fight them. He was paralyzed. He was on a mat. And they lowered him down. And Jesus really was responding not to that man's faith at all. There was no faith evident in that man whatsoever. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ did a work because God heals. And he makes the determination how and when he does that. That's not something that we decide on his behalf. And so what we have here is we have a story of a man who's going to be healed by Jesus. Verse 5, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Huh. Notice verse 5. This man had an infirmity 38 years. Now, why the number 38? Why did he have to mention to us that he had had an infirmity 38 years? Well, one of the commentators that I use said it may be that, that they wanted us to remember Israel's wandering in the wilderness. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 2, verse 14, it reads, The time we took to come from Kadesh Barnea until we crossed over the valley of Zered was 38 years. So his paralysis could symbolize Israel's paralysis because Israel is spiritually paralyzed without Jesus. But he's been in that condition, as it says in verse, verse 5, 38 years. Verse 6 says Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time. And that's the second thing we can see. I want you to notice this. Jesus saw and Jesus knew. In spite of the multitude, and this is a, an important point, in spite of the multitude, his eyes were on one person. And, and again, by way of application, sometimes you may feel that you're just one person in a crowd. And there's so many around you that have needs and sometimes perhaps even greater needs than you have. And you may think that you are simply one of many. And I just love, I, I, you'll, see, you'll see, I'll repeat this over and over as we go through John's gospel. You see this often. And you're going to see that Jesus not only sees multitudes, but he also sees individuals. That is such an important thing to remember always. He ministers to multitudes, but he also ministers to you. He wants to reach everybody, but he also wants to touch you. And there were a lot of people. This, this isn't the only person who's there by the pool. There are others. And Jesus knows, though. In verse 6 again, he says he sees him lying there. And he knew that he had already been in that condition a long time. Jesus knew, in spite of the multitude, his eyes were on that one man. In Isaiah 65, 24, it reads, It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. So even in a noisy crowd, John makes it clear that Jesus is aware of you. I was at a uh, pastor's conference back in 1982. And I remember there were, that's when there were a lot fewer Calvary Chapel ministries. And there may have been a couple of hundred people in the room at that time. And I remember as I was seated there, I can even remember where I was seated in proximity to the, to the pulpit in the, and the platform. I remember very well as I was there amongst all these pastors and leaders. I remember, and I was just a young man. I was 31, 32 at the time. I remember as we were having a time of waiting on the Lord in an afterglow. I remember saying to the Lord, I want to get out of here. I want to leave. Jesus, I just want to go. I just want, I just remember I was so discouraged. I just remember that so well. Jesus, I just, I just want to go. 
I shouldn't even be here. I want to go. And I was just, I had my head down and I was just talking to the Lord. One of the brothers had a word that he spoke. And he said this, he said, there's someone here right now who is saying to the Lord, I don't want to be here. I just want to go. And he says, and the Lord is saying to you, you need to be here because he wants to minister to you. And that's when I began to actually, though I knew it in my head, I began to understand it in my life that there may be a lot of people around me at any given time, but that doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't know I'm there. That doesn't mean that he's not aware of my cry. You know, it's kind of like any parent can say this. It's kind of like you have a nursery, nursery filled with 20 or 30 babies, but every parent can recognize the sound of their own. You hear it. Sometimes you cringe because you know it's yours. <laughs> but it's true because a mama, a dad, knows the sound of the cry of their baby. They know it. And our ears are attuned to their cry for a variety of reasons. But we listen and we'll hear. I remember I was teaching a Bible study, an evening study. We used to have the, uh, the nursery on the right next to us. So you could hear the babies. We only had three. And I can still remember uh, Sunday night I was teaching and then I started, I heard, a, I heard a baby crying. And it was a small group of people, 80 people or so. And I started looking through the, through the church. And I saw mamas. You, you can see their eyes, their eyebrows go up, you know, their eyes get, and they get kind of stiff. And I saw, I, they were right in front of me, all three moms. And then one by one, and it all goes, it happens quickly. First one, Mama's shoulders stopped shrugging. Then this other mama's shoulders stopped shrugging. The other one's shoulders stayed up. And I said, that's the mother. That's the mother. And it was. She recognized the sound of her own baby. The other two mamas knew it wasn't theirs. Why? Because mama hears the cry of her baby. And you know what? Your daddy hears your cry too. And even though... There may be a room full of people, and you can feel nobody knows I'm here. Nobody cares if I'm here. Nobody's aware if I'm here. God is aware that you're there. God is aware of your cry. Keep that in mind. His ear is open unto your cry. He hears you, and he loves you. And even though there were so many crowded there around this pool, Jesus approaches that man he knew he'd been that way for a long time, and he sought him out. He saw him, and he approaches him again. Verse 6, and he said to him, now this is an amazingly important question. Do you want to be made well? Questions have a way of revealing our hearts. Jesus provokes him to ask himself whether he really wants to be healed. Now, he had a, a kind of faith to be healed according to the superstition of his day. But Jesus wants him to direct his faith to the one who can heal him. If within us there is an inclination to remain as we are, often no changes will be made. You want to mark that down. Because some people, myself included in the past, and I probably still do it, can make excuses for remaining where you are, even while saying, but I'm trying so hard. This guy is trying hard. He's there. He's paralyzed. He wants to be. He's got all of those verbal cues going. But Jesus, this is, this is so important. Jesus asks him a question. Do you want to be made well? There are, um, okay, let's see how I can put this without it sounding harsh. I can't, so I'll just say it this way. <laughs> I, I try to be careful how I say things because I realize that 
sometimes the way you say something isn't how you mean it, and I try to be careful like that. I think that there are many churches in the United States that are filled with people who think they're Christians because they're doing the superstitious thing. They go to church. Maybe they give, sometimes they serve. I believe that what has happened in the last generation of our church history since the Jesus movement to now has been that quite a number of people consider themselves to be believers because they go to church, they may pick up the Bible once in a while, they do religious things. But so many times when an invitation is given, people come forward to be saved who have been in the church for a long time. Because you can do the religious thing but never really, never really want to be changed. Never really wanting a new life. Never really wanting to walk. As a matter of fact, when someone speaks to you and says to you, 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 you you've been a Christian for a while. How, how come you're, st I don't want to judge you. I'm just wondering, how, how come you still party? you still don't judge me bro don't judge me bro now wait a minute I'm not I'm asking you do you really want to be made well when I was a brand new Christian I'm talking within a month of my salvation I was reading a booklet I began reading booklets on the Christian life and this fella said in order to be saved, you have to have the same desire to be saved as if you were in a house that was burning and you wanted to get out of that house before it burned up. And I remember saying, I don't think that's true. That sounds kind of legalistic to me. That doesn't make sense to me. But guess what? I now understand what he was trying to say. Lot is told to get out. God is going to destroy Sodom, Gomorrah, and these surrounding cities. You better get out. And don't look back. You just keep going forward. He takes two daughters and he takes his wife. And off they go because his other ones wouldn't leave. Off he goes. And we all know the story. Jesus, all he had to do was say, remember Lot's wife. Because the scripture says she stopped and she looked back. And when you read that, it just, you look back, what's the, no, the, the intent of that is she looked back with longing because her body may have left Sodom, but her heart remained behind. It's not difficult for a person to walk up an aisle when their heart is still in the seat, when they haven't really gotten up and moved. And then later on, they say, and I tried God, and it doesn't work. No, you didn't, you didn't have the desire to get out of that burning house. And now you're blaming God for the burns that you've suffered. I think the question's an important one. Do you want to be made well? Have you gotten, in other words, for us in practical terms, have you gotten, are you in that place Will you say, I am sick of being sick, and I am tired of being tired. I am, I hate, I, I hate what's going on in my life. That's how I got saved, where I finally said, God, I am sick of hurting people. I am sick of being hurt. I am just, I, I, I can't do this anymore. That's Jesus asking, do you want to be made well? And it's interesting because notice verse 7, the sick man answered, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water stirred, stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. I can't help myself, and I have no friends who will help me. 
And so when he says that, this puts him in the place where the Lord can reveal himself to this man. And Jesus says in verse 8, rise, take up your bed, walk. <laughs> uh, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but I can't. I'm paralyzed. I've been in this condition 38 years. And you're telling me to rise? And not only to rise, but to pick up my bed, the thing that has been carrying me, I'm supposed to carry that? Rise. Jesus gives impossible commands. As a matter of fact, when you read your Bible, he does this more than once. There was a man with a crippled hand in the synagogue, and, and, and Jesus spoke to him in front of the scribes and Pharisees. Luke tells us in chapter 6, verse 10, that Jesus looked around at them all, and then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He can't. His hand is crippled. How am I going to do that? And yet, Jesus said, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. When the apostle Peter was walking on water, well, Matthew tells us that Jesus said to him, uh, come to me. Peter was in the boat. Jesus was walking on water. And Jesus says to him, come on to me. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out, come to you on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water. That's impossible. Every time we're in, in Israel, we're on the Sea of Galilee. And almost, almost every time our, our guide or someone will say, anybody want to take a walk? <laughs> because it's impossible. We all know that. And yet Jesus made the sea as hard as concrete. But it's an impossible command. Stretch out your hand. My hand is withered. I can't. Walk on water. It's impossible to walk on water. So with God, all things are possible. With God, he takes the cripple, the one with no power, and he gives him the ability to stretch out his hand. To the one who cannot walk, Jesus says, pick up your mat, take a walk. To the one who could never do the impossible of walking on water, Jesus says, come. So the Lord does that. And so as he says that, rise, take up your bed and walk. Notice verse 9, immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed, walked. <laughs> and that day was the Sabbath. And so Jesus commands the man to do something that was breaking the law of the Sabbath, at least the way that was understood. The law prohibited all work, and especially the carrying of burdens. But Jesus tells him to take up his bed. Why would he do something like that? Well, one of the simple uh, answers to that is that he was a poor man. And if he had left his bed, he might have lost it. So it's a way of him just saying, carry that with you, so it's not lost amongst all these people and what's about to take place. So as he tells him to do that, verse, again, verse 9 again, notice, that day was the Sabbath. Now this work provokes the first signs of hostility towards Jesus because verse 10, the Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it's the Sabbath, it's not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who's the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you've been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. So immediately notice in verse 10 how they said, uh, It's not lawful for you to be doing that. You see, in Israel, the Sabbath begins at dusk on Friday. It ends at dusk on Saturday. And, and the Sabbath is intended for the Jewish people to rest and to worship God. Uh, Christians have, have kept the first day of the week because that's the day Jesus was resurrected. So worshiping on Sunday is not something that is a hard, fast rule, but it has been what the church has done from the beginning. Uh, because this healing occurred on the Sabbath, the religious authorities are in arm, up in arms because they believe that both Jesus and this man violated the law. Now, they said Jesus violated the Sabbath because they believed that healing was actually work. Isn't that interesting? That they believed that the one performing a healing was actually working on Shabbat. When you, when you read Luke chapter 13, there's a story of Jesus healing a, a crippled woman. 
And when he did so, he's rebuked for doing so. According to Luke 13, 14, the ruler of the synagogue said, there's six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. So they believed that a work like Jesus performed was actually violating the Sabbath. But they also believed the man violated the Sabbath because he carried his mat. Now, the Sabbath is a day dedicated to God. It's not to be filled with pursuing the things of the world, and therefore they get upset over that. And also they say in verse 10, it's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. So they were conforming to the letter of the law, but not its spirit, because he should have, they should have been rejoicing that God had done a work for this man, but instead they're judging him. Well, in verse 11, the man says, well, the, he answered them, and he said, he who made me well said, take up your bed and walk. So it seems like he's blaming the one who made me well is the one you should be speaking to. At this point, there's not really a lot of observable gratitude. It may be almost that he's distancing himself from the Lord. I'm not sure about that, but it can appear that way. So they ask him in verse 12, who is this one? Who's the man? Now, when they asked him, who is the man? Who is the man is intended to contrast Jesus, a man with God's law, which is divine. Well, he didn't know his name. He couldn't see Jesus anywhere in the crowd because according to verse 13, Jesus had left. And the crowd in the area was getting agitated. They'd be reacting to the miracle. So he withdrew himself. He hadn't finished his work. He wouldn't expose himself to the envy and malice of the Jewish rulers. But verse 14, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you've been made well, sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you. A worse thing? Let's look at that for just a moment. You've been made well, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Let me say something that uh, would just take a moment to say. Early in my ministerial life, I remember somebody writing a column, a column in a magazine, stating that Jesus never never referred to people as sinners. And I thought that was interesting. And I was really new in ministry, and I thought, hmm, Jesus never referred to people as sinners? He never called someone or made reference to their sin? And this person was very well known, and I thought, how interesting. And so I began to look into that. Is that true? Is that true? And, and I'm doing that on purpose. I'm bringing this up for you on purpose because I want you to see verse 14. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. So, there's a, a story we're going to be looking at in chapter 8 of a woman who got, uh, who was, was a sinner. And Jesus speaks to the woman and says, I don't condemn you. And then he goes on to say to her, go and sin no more. And here he's saying the same kind of thing to this man. Um, some commentators say that the sins of his youth may have resulted in his paralysis. The same kind of thing might be said of the man on the mat in Mark chapter 2. So Jesus would know what caused his infirmity and he would be warning him not to repeat it. So, one, Jesus will say, go and sin no more, because sin very often has resulted in something in our life that we end up reaping consequences for. And yeah, Jesus does say not to sin, because he came to save the world, and he came to lay his life down to cleanse us from our sin. But at the same time, what we see is a warning in the midst of his mercy. And when he says, you've been made well, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. When you've been cleansed by the Lord, it is best not to return to the old life. Oh, gosh, I don't want. Some things I want to share with you would take longer than I can. And I'm going to conclude in a moment, but 
just keep this in mind. I'll put it like this. Never take the grace of God. Because a lot of people like to talk about how gracious God is. And he is. And we're saved by grace. And we're gifted by grace. And we walk in grace. It's all grace. But never take it for granted. Because some people stretch grace to cover over the sin they want to continue to practice. And then they get upset at the person who says, but the Lord says we're to be free of those things. That a person who is who's in sin is in bondage to it. And didn't Jesus set us free? And, and didn't he give us the power of the Holy Spirit to live for Christ? And, 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 and weren't you crucified in Christ? Aren't, isn't your old man dead and buried in him? And, and doesn't the spirit who raised Christ from the dead, doesn't he dwell in your mortal bodies? And doesn't that same spirit give life to you now? And if that's the case, how can you make an excuse to remain in sin? So go and sin no more. It's real simple. And yet there are arguments going on right now in the minds of Christians, maybe even in this room right now. That sounds like legalism. No, that's called the gospel. We've been set free from sin, not to remain in it or return to it. We're not the dog who returns to his vomit. We're not the pig who returns to the, the mire that it was washed from. Those are the old things of the old life that destroyed us, that caused us to cry ourselves to sleep at night, that made us afraid sometimes to be around certain people because they were after us or we ripped them off. Those are the old things that, that are crucified with Christ. That old, that old man is dead. And so don't return. Don't return to it. You know, one of the things the enemy, I can say this with 100% certainty, one of the things that the enemy whispers in your ear is this, it was better before you knew Jesus. He whispers that to you. It was better when you used to use it. It's Friday now. you got no place to go. You used to party. You used to have friends. People show up. They took you out. Now you're by yourself because you're a Christian. You're lonely and, and, and nobody likes you anymore. Go back. Give her a call. She likes you. Take her out for some coffee. No biggie. And before you know it, you're waking up in her bed the next morning. And you're saying, how did I get here? It's because the inclinations of your flesh is a desire to wander back to what you were washed from. And Jesus said, go and sin no more. Move forward, don't move back. Lest a worse thing come up, a worse thing than laying on a mat, a worse thing than being paralyzed for 38 years. There's something worse than that? Yes, judgment. 38 years is a long time. Eternity we can't even figure out how long that is. I tried to figure it out once. I can't. It would be like, it'd be like you or me counting every single grain of sand on every beach and desert in the world, one by one. And once you get to the last one, you start again. Can you fathom that? I can't. It is time without end, never ending. What is worse than 38 years? Eternity without God. That's worse. It never ends. It never ends. There's no getting up off that mat and walking. It's just your life forever. And so that's a stern warning Matthew 20, uh, 10, 28, I'll close with this. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both, in soul and body, both soul and body in hell. So the man departs, according to verse 15, tells the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. Now, it may be that he did this to secure himself from the, the charge of Sabbath breaking, or it may be that he saw this miracle as validating Christ as the one who was sent from God. Somebody said it is probable that he went in the simplicity of his heart, desirous both to publish what Christ had done to his honor and also to do good to others who might also stand in need of his help. Whatever the case may be, he departed and he told Jesus, 
Jesus sought him out the first time and healed him. He sought him out a second time and warned him. So may God speak to us, because not only has he healed us, but he also warns us. <laughs>